today's uh, episode, I'm talking with Natalie Harris, So For Life. She's based out of Israel. Well, not based out of Israel, but she re relocated from the UK back to Israel. And today we're going to get a sense of picture from somebody who lives in Israel, not in Jerusalem, not in Tel Aviv, but in, right in the center um, of, of Israel and what life is like for the average person living there, both when it looks at racism, when it looks, when we look at um, cultural inclusion. There's so much we hear in the news from the Palestinian side, from neighboring Iran, Syria, e Egypt, and it's just good to get a picture as to what it's like when you're in there. So um, I'm just going to about bring her in and um, hope you enjoy today's session. This should be good. So, yeah, so I actually sort of introduced this view of Natalie Harris, aka So For Life, and, um, but I also introduced the fact that you used to you were born here in the UK, moved to Israel, moved back to the UK and other places, but then you sort of relocated back to Israel. And I think one of the fascinating things for most of us growing up, no matter whether you're a Christian or Muslim or Jew, is that, oh, you don't have any religion at all. Israel has always seems to be in the center of the news um, for especially as the Middle East heats up and stuff. But I think away from the politics of, of living in Israel, I think it's, it, it's good to get a picture as to what it's like as an average citizen living in, in Israel. And, um, and I think we can start off with just saying, when you, 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 know, you went back in, yeah, I think you relocated when you were probably around eight or nine, you, and around the time you relocated, it was in the, in the middle of mid eighties, and that was pretty much when they nineteen eighty. Nineteen eighty. So that's that's pretty much around the time when things started heating up in the Middle East. I mean, prior to that, the Middle East was almost like, you know, going to Greece or tele or or, or, or Spain on holiday it was very much from especially from Iran and and all those areas and. You know, when the revolutionary started in, in Iran, it just seemed there was a spread of uh, change around the Middle East and um, all of a sudden Israel became very much a, of a focal point. But I think we can start off with when you were eight, nine, you moved back to, you moved to Israel for the first time. What was that like for you? Okay, well, just to say on that, though, that Israel has always had wars even before I moved to Israel in 1980. I mean, there's the uh, Yom Kippur War and uh, a war where my mum was supposed to come in 1967 and it got postponed slightly and then she came later on. And um, then when we moved in 1980, I was nine years old. So where we moved to was quite like an anglicized city. Uh, about 20 minutes north of Tel Aviv and at that age I didn't have much of an impact and there wasn't anything in our area where I would feel anything we we didn't have uh, Israeli Jewish and Israeli Arab integration at all it's nowhere near like a Palestinian border of any kind uh, the only first thing that I personally noticed was that around 10 around 10 years old Mm. Um, I noticed, I remember coming home one day crying to my mum, there's a monster downstairs, there's a monster downstairs. Wow. And, and it's very vivid till today. Um, and she said, what do you mean? And she came down with me and we had a look and it was a man and she realised who it was. Yeah. It was a friend of a neighbour's that was injured in the war or in the army at the time. Yeah. And he was completely deformed. He had changed drastically. He used to be a very big built man, uh, friendly, and his speech was different. He was actually residing in a, a mental disability hospital very close to where we live. And he obviously wanted to visit his friend a lot, and he came. Um, so that was the first 
impact that I'd ever seen in person in Israel. And then uh, we moved, when I was 15, we moved to a place called al Menashe, which uh, is right on the border of Samaria. We're considered partly Samarian, um, but we're, we're very close to the border, so we're not full in, whereas my sister's full in. She's a lot further in, and then obviously I work uh, doing voluntary work with United Hatzalah, where okay. we do emergency medical services. So a lot of my units in the Samaria, and we see a lot more that happens there. So when I moved in, when I moved when I was just just clarify. So you mentioned Samaria. So mm-hmm. a lot of Christians will remember Samaria and Samaritans. Is that the same, or is it different? Is that the same Samaria Samaritans? That we you read Fun? You got me there. I'm not even 100% sure. Okay. I, I'd have to I'd have to educate myself a bit further on that side. Okay. Uh, it's uh, it's called Shamron, which is uh, Arab land but Jewish occupation. Is that what is that's what Shamron means? No. Shamron okay. Is so- just, the word for Samaria. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, someone's was it, okay. So you were just. So I thought someone meant Arab land, but Jewish occupation. I was like, okay, you've named a town after <laughs> what was going on. Okay, that's fine. So, continue with your stuff. Okay. So when I when I was fifteen, we moved here because we needed to buy property, and this was a new development, and it was originally this town, Al Fayman Asher. Uh, which means a thousand menaches <laughs> <laughs> started off um, as a town for um, permanent military families. Um, and then it developed and they opened up the town for regular citizens and residents. Mm-hmm. And quite at the beginning when I moved there, we had a very big case which was publicized worldwide. It was quite huge at the time. So I'm talking about 1986, seven, mm-hmm. um, where a family from here were petrol bombed by a terrorist. Oh. Um, there were six of them in the car. Uh, the mother who was pregnant died. And then shortly after, a couple of weeks after, one of the, the youngest son died. Mm. And the rest of the family and the one friend that was with them uh, are scarred internally and externally for life. Um, Ironically, the father later then opened up a petrol station at the entrance of our town. For years, he he owned, owned it. I think he still owns the land because he was compensated slightly from the government for what they went through. Um, so that was major, and I remember that night very strongly because we went down, a lot of us from here, and to protest to remove the trees from the sides of the roads uh, so that there would be more visibility and to try to avoid that ever happening again. Um, there have been more cases since, yeah. I can say for sure. Um, there's been shooting. Uh, one neighbour died from a shooting attack on the road. And then I'm, 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 so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out then, so here you are as a young eight, nine-year-old, you've left cold, dreary England back to the Middle East. I'm sure it might have been like a, a vacation because I, I, you know, I, I grew up in Liverpool, which was cold and dreary, <laughs> moved to Nigeria when I was around nine, ten, and at first it felt like a vacation hot weather, palm trees, and actually Nigeria was actually relatively wealthy at that point in time, so it felt great. But as the years went through, the, 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 you, you, the, the instability, I noticed the difference, you know, electricity, um, the way things were done, you know, not as in order. So, so I'm just wondering, now that's a very different experience. We did not have... Um, Ultra sort of, shock. Uh, no, no, not the culture. So I think we did not have the sort of the security sort of issues that might have affected somebody moving to Israel. Because as I said, when you have neighbors all around, 
and then you have internally struggles. I mean, so growing up, at, you know, eight, nine, ten, twelve, and stuff. Was did you note? Was there a sense of ch- shift in in safety, or did you were you just a kid like ah, this is fun, I'm having fun, I'm sun all the time, you know? What, what was that <laughs> Yeah, I was pretty much just a regular kid at that time. It hit later where I realized where we were. Um, Obviously, there were some culture shocks and it took me quite a long time to get settled in. Even um, I did a lot of dancing when I was younger and that helped. And then music came into our lives because MTV joined us. And uh, But originally, we didn't even have a telephone at home. Wow. So we we would go like to a pay phone and we'd have pay tokens, like little coin tokens, special ones. Mm-hmm. You'd put it in. So I remember also sometimes they would get stuck in there and then you could make free calls for ages. So we'd call all the people that we knew from like UK and we'd say, oh, there's a stuck phone. Come and make your phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone would call England. Uh, but I grew up pretty much um, protected. I would say, um, um, yeah, I didn't feel did, it in either. So when did the reality, when I, yeah, and I was saying, when did the reality hit that, okay, um, all is not well in a sense where uh, you've got to get ready to join the army when you're 18 uh, or the military yeah. when you're 18 or, and yeah. um, there is, you know, this is, a, we have quite a lot of enemies all around. When did you? When did that become a reality? It started a lot more when I was fifteen, when we moved. Like I said, uh, because of the reality of being more surrounded uh, by Arab villages and uh, one of the biggest Arab towns, Kalkilia. But at that time, the Intifada hadn't started, so we used to actually go into Kalkilia and do some shopping there. I remember we used to buy uh, furniture and all different things and we would sit and have a coffee sometimes with our arab neighbors um and that kind of all changed with the intifada later on what was that uh, intifada what, what was that what's that intifada was the 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 war the arab palestinian war uprising um where there were a lot of attacks vice versa okay. i would say um and then borders were created and closed off more so mm-hmm. Israeli Jewish people didn't go into the Arab areas as much particularly the ones that were bordered off as to be called Palestine oh so, so, the, so they're, they're initially so those are there were Arabs so they're, they're so they're very similar to the Arabs in in Saudi Arabia that type of Arab. I'm just trying to get my yeah, experience Muslim. because I never knew Muslim. I actually didn't realize Palestinians were Arabs I that I assumed you've got you know, Persians and, and you've got those from Iran. Ah, so okay. I didn't realize that when I hear Arabs, I'm okay. thinking Saudi Arabia. Okay. When I'm referring to Arabs as in Palestinians, I'm referring to Muslims, Muslim Arabs um, that are now under Palestinian control. Okay. And uh, bordered from Israel with a control. Some do enter Israel for work. Um there are also Arab Israelis that uh, have lived here for generations and have their own towns. They integrate with us uh, as far as shopping is concerned. But there is very, apart from Jaffa, which is in Tel Aviv, it's very, very rare that you would see an Arab Israeli in a so-called Israeli Jewish town or city. Uh, those Arab Israelis are they Jewish or are they Muslim? Muslim, Muslim. Okay. So there, are, is... there are also some Christian Arab Israelis in some areas, like Nazareth, Bethlehem, Haifa, and places like that. Okay. Um, but most of them, when I'm referring to Arabs, they're Muslim Arabs and okay. practice Islam. And uh, there are some very uh, there are, there, like I said, there's an integration of somewhat. Uh, mm. We have, in my local supermarket, we have Arab Israelis working here from a town not far away. Uh, if you go to the big shopping mall in the next city, 
uh, most of the workers are Arab Israelis uh, and the shoppers as well. Mm. They do all their shopping. Um, restaurants and things in big cities Arab Israelis go to as well. Mm. You just don't have really living and studying together. Okay. And not as many interracial relationships either. There okay. are some. But it's not ever been a done thing. Mm. And I think it's on both sides. Okay. Uh, I, I personally wouldn't, would love to have an Arab Israeli living right next door to me. I think we could learn from each other and our cultures. Yeah. Uh, but I just, I'm not sure if it will ever, ever happen in my lifetime. Okay. Or ever at all. Well, before we miss off for that, because we, you, we, you, because you were telling the story about how at around fifteen or so that you used to go to the Arab markets to shop, have coffee, mm -hmm. and then the Intifada, which is when I think it might have been Yasser Arafat declaring that sort of sort of war, um, and then everyone had to sort of order off. Then what, as a teenager, changed in your eyes? I mean, what was that like on the ground? So. I'm not looking at the politics, I'm just looking at the reality of life on the ground for a young kid who has sort of moved from a, a stable Europe to um, an environment where it just seems as if everyone's on the edge. What was that like then? Apart from situations that happened once we moved to Alfame and Australia, I didn't, it didn't have much of a daily impact on me. Um, Israelis have always had an attitude of, that we, we hurt deeply when something happens to an Israeli Jewish person in the country, um, but we always get up and move on immediately. There's no uh, that you scared every day to walk out of your house. Mm -hmm. Some people might. I've just never had that feeling from people around me. It's an everyday life thing that something could happen, but the mm -hmm. same as, I guess, what's going on in America, that every day a black man or woman or child walks out of their house, something could happen as well. Mm. Uh, but the only difference is it's not an issue of color of our skin. It's an issue of political aggression. Mm. Uh, I would always, like I always said, it's part of a parcel. It's, I'm never going to finger point on who's to blame. Mm. I always just look at what damage has been caused and who's been hurt from it. Yeah. So then you said by that time you noticed the difference. And then did you, were you how, when were you made aware that at 18 you have to serve in, in the military for, for a year or two years? Oh, you know, immediately in Israel, it's a thing. Uh, <laughs> everybody serves um, in the military. Girls were two, at the time two years, boys for three years. Yeah, but uh, when did I'm you? Saying, was, I'm saying girls it, and boys because I still consider that age as a child. I don't yeah, but think I'm, that I'm, is a full adult. Yeah, so but you're saying everyone knows, but when did you when it did you, so you know, as I said, if I'm at eight at, at ten years old, do you, do you look forward to turning eighteen to serve in the military or does it become when you're fifteen like oh my goodness? Yeah, I think know, it comes a bit years older. To join the army. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It comes like in the teens more uh, particularly seventeen, because there's a, a rule here that if you're here past your 17th birthday in one month, then you're automatically signed up. So mm -hmm. you definitely have to do it. So it comes like an 11th grade kind of thing. So what was that for, for you? Was there a, was that an exciting thing to look forward to? Was it a worry? Originally or was I was. Originally excited. I was. I was very excited at start. I was a bit worried because I was a bit of a wild child growing up here, a bit of a rebel, uh, musically, culturally, and all different things. Not all my friends' uh, families were quite happy about me. <laughs> uh, and I, I smoked and I drank. And I was a bit of a rebel. Okay. Um, but yeah, I was initially quite excited about it and I did my uh, national service the um the mandatory basic training mm. uh i was i actually turned 18 while i was doing it i had my birthday in the basic training wow 
and it was a shock because everything's different and common sense goes out the door. <laughs> uh, everything's very hierarchy. And, um, and then I went and did a course for communication machines. And then I wanted to be a communications instructor. And uh, they said that because of my accent in Hebrew, that I can't train uh, 18 year olds that are joining the army because they'd laugh at me. And so I ended up uh, instructing reserve soldiers, which are people that have finished the army but come back for training and service once a year until 40, 50, something like that. Okay. And, I think, uh, yeah, no, I think you said something very interesting. So, and, I, and, I, and, I, and this is to remind everyone that you were born in the UK. And I would assume, did you learn Hebrew when you were in the UK or did you learn it when you no. moved back? To, so you, moved, you when learned I moved Hebrew to when you moved to Israel. So, and I, and I know that there's, you know, when I was in America, there's a number of people who were like, yeah, we're moving back to Israel. So I would assume they're Americans learning the language when, when they go in there. But Not as, yeah, only when arriving, some. Yeah. some. But then, so you're saying that you say, here you are learning the language, but they're saying you have an accent in yeah. Hebrew and it might be the people who are born and raised here might think what will they make fun or I mean when you were not speaking Hebrew were people speaking English uh yeah I spoke I had a lot of English speaker friends here that I grew up with and made friends along the way that were English speakers as well but when you're in the uh, army you have to speak like Hebrew that. yeah yeah and the same is happening with my daughter now Okay. Exactly. Okay. The same. okay. So, okay. <laughs> so it's funny. It's happening second generation now because she grew up in the UK. Okay. So we've we've got you in the army doing the communications. You seven years, three, you're two years, and then what? After two between years, you and me, I didn't say this before, but I didn't complete my two years. Okay. I found it really difficult. Uh, uh, all the rules and I would like I said I was a bit of a rebel and I tried to move base I wasn't happy on the base that I was on uh, mainly because I was I was just kind of messed up in the system really and it happened a lot back then it's not as much now most of the time now uh, parents can actually approach and help uh, there's more people to speak to now in the army and groups and Mm -hmm. communities and because we have social network a lot a lot more is out in the open mm -hmm. but back then there was nothing we didn't have mobile phones computers nothing mm -hmm. and I was kind of lost in the system on that and my parents not having been uh, born and brought up here didn't have the connections that were needed to help me and we didn't have many Israeli friends yet at that time we'd only been here what six seven years uh no eight years by then but my parents are very british okay. very much british i mean if you heard them speak in hebrew you'd think they're speaking in english but in another language <laughs> their, ac their accent is like full british when they're speaking in hebrew okay <laughs> so i kind of try to move base and improve the situation that i was in because it was a closed base which means that you don't come home every day but it was far from home uh, mm. sorry it was an open base Sorry, you might have to edit this. It was an open base. <laughs> it was an open base, uh, but it was far from home. And because of where I lived in a, in Al Fame and Ashe, it was about we used to hitchhike back then. Now your uh, soldiers are not allowed to hitchhike because of security reasons. Mm. But back then I'd have to hitchhike and I'd have a gun because of where I lived. Wow. So I'd be carrying a gun. And so they said, oh, because you have such a far distance, then just sleep on the base during the week. But the accommodations were terrible because mm. it was an open base. So I just wanted to move and they were playing about with me. And in the end, I faked a nervous breakdown <laughs> and ended up going to an army psychologist. And the psychologist, the first thing he said, instead of helping me, was... Uh, okay, I can release you on a profile of 21, which is the lowest, which is psychological, and you won't have to do the army anymore. Uh -huh. So I took it, which in Hindra, it might have been a mistake. 
and I might have just should have stuck it out. But yeah, you can't yeah. hold a wild child. You can't hold a wild child down. <laughs> Sure, I've learned sure. I've learned to do that myself over the years. <laughs> and I'm sure your parents were hoping that okay, she's there for two years, we'll we'll get a golden child out who's respectable and we can and, and stuff. But after you came out, what 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 was the next what 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 happened next? Um I worked here, I traveled a lot abroad, I went to Germany quite a lot over three years, uh working partly with Israelis, we were selling at festivals, all different items, different things in the summer and the winter. But you're talking about um, traveling there, and I'll just hold back a little bit, because we had Munich, um, which was um, which was in, in the early 80s and stuff, where the, uh, the Israeli um, Olympic team um, were kidnapped. Were attacked, yeah. It, we, we had Antebe, which was um, in yeah. uh, as well. So did you not then think, Holding your passports, you are a target, you know. Oh, I have a British. I have a British passport because I was born in the UK. Okay, so you, when you were traveling so, to people, you did not go around, you know, with a star of David around your back. And <laughs> I hid it. I hid it drastically. I was petrified from okay. that side of things. When things started, you could sense as well. You could sense places where you have to. You can proudly say I'm from Israel I'm Jewish and um, the same as not too long ago in England I experienced things like that oh. and then there were places where you just keep quiet about it and hide mm. the fact I would never lie about it yeah but, but you wouldn't you don't openly... publicize it yeah. yeah okay so I, mean, so I travel talk... always on my British passport and then entering and exiting Israel I use the Israeli passport because that's the law here. Okay. Okay. So my we've... daughter's got my daughter's got three passports. Okay. So okay, and I guess that that will help us move to the cultural side because I know your daughter, her dad is is Nigerian um, from the same tribe as me, Igbo. But yeah. So we, we've looked at sort of the the political side or the sort of the security side, the cultural side because right now. Um, there's there's a sort of awakening of people understanding that you know what we've sort of mistreated a black race for more than 400 years. Um, you know it's really George Floyd's death in America really sort of almost awoken up a conscience that people were like wow we didn't realize it was that bad kind of thing. And and I've noticed companies and institutions, um, even the Church of England, the Bank of England, they've all said yep we've messed up in the past. We're holding up our hand. We're apologizing. Companies are saying, "Yep, we've, we've done this." The British Museum are now thinking about returning artifacts of that they've taken from these African countries by force. So there's that sense of, "Yeah, we've done bad," um, and there's a reckoning. Um, I, you know, I mentioned I've, I've, you know, brought up here in the UK, school and lived in America for ten years, and I, so I was aware of sort of the cultural race divide and things. And, but I think there's not enough known about life in Israel. I was really surprised. I think oh, last year I was just on Twitter and I saw an article from the New York Times about, I think it's Ethiopians, Jewish Ethiopians. Um, and it reminded me of France where they, they, you know, they've had the slums in France and they were like saying, look, I think one a young kid was was shot by the police officer or something like that, and there was a sense of injustice there. And so it didn't get much traction because it's not known. Israel's not known for its sort of race relationships. It's not known for that. It just it it seemed like a very odd story, and after a while it just disappeared. And it, it was quite random, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I think I, when you say random, I think it's more from on the outside. It was like, a, oh, where's that story from? And then. Phew, it disappeared, so we don't know what's going on in in there. And I think it'll be interesting to find out. And and I think from your point of view, just on the ground, and you know, you've got experience with it, dealing with people from other parts of of the world. What's what's Israel like? I mean, is it is it a welcoming country, especially since they've had their their own histories of being persecuted? Do they mix well with other races? I know the Arabs. You mentioned the Arabs. There isn't much of a 
interaction with them just due to security. But you know, if I moved over to Israel right now as a as a black British Nigerian Christian, would they think, hey, would would I just be welcomed in if I'm working in a bank? Or oh, I mean, what, what's your take on that? Mm, just saying about you coming as a Christian, probably not, oh, okay. uh, unless you, unless you converted to Islamism <laughs> as a tourist, uh, like converted to Judaism. I mean, wow. if you were a tourist, there's a rule in Israel: every Jew is allowed to live in Israel. It's a rule. Okay, a law. Okay. Uh, in 1948, when the state of Israel was created that all Jews worldwide, no matter what culture or race, if you are Jewish, you are entitled to live in Israel. Mm. And you do get certain rights as well when you come, support, etc. So we had a lot of support when we moved to Israel as British um, immigrants. And all over the world there are immigrants uh, about black Israelis and black people that are living in Israel, not as Israelis, they have different statuses. Uh, some are illegal, some are refugees, some have leave to remain, and some are residents and some are citizens. So yeah. it's quite complex. And that could be with all cultures and origins as well. Within that, you could have different statuses. So, but I think it's quite similar in some in in UK. There was the whole thing there with Windrush, uh, with the status of leave to remain. I remember it was very difficult for someone that I knew to get a passport, even though he was born in England. Yeah, but then I, I think you know, England, Britain have had you know, four hundred plus years of, of their col colony and their stuff. I think Israel being a a country founded on people who've been persecuted for centuries and they sort of like, you know, we've come in a place where we can be supportive and welcoming. Um, as a black, okay, let's just think about the black Jews. So whether yeah, let me talk about the different okay. uh, black people that live in Israel. Okay. So you have, um, you have black Ethiopians. Let's start from them. Uh, the black Ethiopians came from Ethiopia during the famine, the first, first lot. There have been okay. several, Early several migrations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of them walked through the deserts to get here. Uh, mm -hmm. they were, uh, there was a lot of going on with bringing the Ethiopians to Israel at the time, considering them as the Lost Dan tribe. Mm. And which is also a very interesting conversation. Maybe one day you and I can talk about that. Mm. Uh, extremely interesting story about the Lost Tribe, Dan Tribe. The same as you have the Manasha Tribe from India. There's fascinating stories. Mm. Um, the Ethiopians that came over originally um, were allowed to live here, settle here. They were located in like a neighborhood of some kind or several neighborhoods. Um, the integration was extremely slow. Uh, they also had to learn the language, the Hebrew language. Um, they weren't looked upon, let's say, as high quality immigrants. Compared to those who came from the US, the UK, and Europe. Yes. Yes. And. Even though the Ethiopians have now, we're going into second, third generation, uh, there is more integration, I would say, with my daughter's generation, whereas they go to school more together and the army definitely together. Mm. I still think there's a lot of integration with the Ethiopians and the Israelis from other backgrounds. And I'm very much hoping that that will not become a case in the end. But as long as the Ethiopians can keep their culture and identity, because I would quote from Jane Elliott, this isn't a, a melting pot. This is a salad and it should stay a salad so that each person put together in a bowl has their own identity. Mm. Uh, that's my opinion. Yeah. 
um, there is uh, a racism in Israel. It exists, and I'm talking racism um, from, let's say, Eastern Europeans to Spanish and Portuguese Europeans, um, Middle Eastern European uh, Jews, um, such as Yemenite, Moroccan, who've been here for centuries and centuries, some of them. Um, uh, definitely decades. Um, then you've also got uh, racism, I would say, against Ethiopians. You have against Arab Israelis. And let's not kind of go too much into the Palestinian Arabs. So that's yeah. a lot more political than mm. there's a whole that's also a whole other story yeah and um, i've the racism isn't particularly physically violent whereas it is in america and you and uk mm. it's not that same kind of violence it's a very subtle quiet suppressing racism mm. If you know what I mean, mm. uh, they still use the word "kushi" for a black person, which comes from the Kushites in the Bible. Yeah, which I, I I personally don't agree with that word, and I keep telling them, please use the word "black," which is "shahol." Um, but when they say that, are they saying that in a negative tone? Uh, are they saying it in a sort of a negative, like "kushi," or is it just a? Uh, uh, Usually it's just from what they know. It's, but then I've always said ignorance is racism. Even if it doesn't come from a bad place, it still needs educating. Mm. It's still offensive to some people. It's definitely offensive to me. So, I mean, and I'm, so I'm, I'm considered white. Because you know, because you, you step back and you mention that there's sort of racism from the Eastern Europeans, the the, the whites, the, the the Latin American, the Latin sort of Jews that have all moved in. Then, when you sort of say that there's there there has to then be um, a more prominent group who maybe they're the ones in government, maybe they're the ones who make most of the money, and so then they they tend to say we're the, the main guys and anyone else is sort of beneath us they don't have to always say it but in their actions in in the way they they look down and, and address which that cultural, has been the case, in my opinion which, which strand is that then are they the ones who were there from generations or do they come from eastern europe or do they are they the ones who came where do those ones the ones who have the sort of not the will the power that sort of look down on anyone else and i maybe they're not remember. doing so, Okay, you must uh, consider that Israel is uh, very diverse because of the Jews that came from all over the world. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying going back, looking at the history side of things and the Bible, that Israelis always existed here in Israel from mm. the beginning of time. Uh, talking, I'm referring to Bible. Yeah. Uh, then move to different locations, etc., and the Jewish DNA became Europeanized. I still look at it as a kind of uh, similarity to Africans that left the equator and went into other places as well to uh, and created other cultures. And because of the climate changes, uh, skin color changed, mm. cultures changed, etc. So similar to that, uh, Israel is a diverse place where people have come from all over. Okay. Um, the state of Israel as an official country was created in 1948. Mm -hmm. And the people that came to build it up, there were already Yemenites living here, Jewish Yemenites, Jewish Moroccans, uh, possibly Iraq and Iranians and more living here already but when the jewish europeans came from europe following the second world war the holocaust yeah they came with professions education money they were they were educated they came 
if they had money left from what wasn't taken from them during the Holocaust. Mm. But it, even so, they came with education and knowledge. Mm. And they worked on building Israel as a country to what uh, it is today. Okay. I'm not saying that by saying, God forbid, by saying that the uh, Middle Eastern Jews were not educated and, God forbid, are stupid. Don't get me wrong. No, no, no. No, there, there's a difference between centuries of, of, as I think, especially in Europe, they have centuries of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a civilization which they yes. sort of rolled out across the, the globe. So even in America, even in, in Africa and Asia and stuff, they, you know, the Chinese had centuries of, 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 of civilization. Even Egypt would say the same. But then there was this sort of a Europeanized sort of this is how we're going to be doing things around the world from from time to standards of medication, of medicine, and everything. And so everyone have everyone has seemed to have adapted to this the way the Europeans have sort of sort of led the world. So it's understandable that they've come in, they've seen structured order. Um, you you live in I think if you think about how in Europe, so Nigeria for example. You know, if you say to somebody, we're going to have a meeting in the afternoon, even if you say two o'clock, people are just going to come three or four because it's afternoon. So there's I no... love that. Yeah. So you, you, know, can... you know what an outdooring is? If you, no. have a, you know what an outdooring is? An outdooring is an Igbo thing that you present your child to your friends and family. Okay. But when my daughter was born at three months, approximately, we did an outdooring. So... Israelis are also not very timely, whereas my <laughs> British family are over timely, yeah. and my Nigerian family are way past timing. Yeah. So when we did an invitation, if the party was to start, let's say at one p.m., yeah, we invited the British people to come at two p.m. so yeah. that they were a little bit late. Yeah. We invited the Israelis to come at twelve p.m. And we told the Ebos to come at 10 a.m. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's pretty much. You what know we what do. I mean, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah. So I can imagine then when you have Europeans coming over, they're very much okay. We need to, you know, planning and structure. <laughs> so I can see how that structure would have come in. So it's not degrading others. It's just saying that they've found a system that seems to be very efficient, time and and and, and resources that actually sh yields because they test everything evidence-based and everything so I but can imagine. has it become a systematic racism following that years later hmm. so all very nice and well done that they brought in their education and knowledge and created a structure and rules and regulations and uh, they built this country in such a short time to an absolutely incredible country with hmm. technology and medicine uh, sort of one dozens of awards mm. uh, one of the best armies in the whole world mm. as well but has has that leadership created some kind of systematic racism over time that the integration hasn't happened correctly yet that's mm. always been a question that i've asked yeah because you mentioned you about, yeah yeah no and, and and i can think you can always be on the on a front foot that you don't sit back and, and look around and says, okay, well, look what we've created. How can we make it more efficient at home? Because you're constantly thinking, how do we keep ourselves protected? How do we keep growing? You know, it's just like a family is having kids and then it's like, good, you've got a big family, but you're not, you know, investing. Okay. Let's just see how this child is developing and stuff. Yeah. Now looking at the, and so not looking. Do you want to see the other Afri the other black people in Israel? Yeah, that's that's what I was trying to get to because I wanted because uh, we, we spoke what? about the 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 um, Ethiopians. And... Just about the Ethiopians to touch on that. Uh, the the there was a riot, like you said, uh, last July. Yeah. I was already living back here, and I didn't participate in the riot, but I was very aware of it and read up on it, and you know. Uh, my daughter actually got caught out in one of them. Mm. Um, caught out as in she got stuck and couldn't get home. And so uh, 
like you said, an Ethiopian young man was shot by an, uh, uh, an off-duty officer with his children in a park. And justly or unjustly, he was shot. Mm. Uh, the same as what's been happening in America and the UK. And the Ethiopians did stand up and did riot. And there has been some more openness about it since. Um, I think there should be a lot more, personally. Mm. But I'm looking at that. We've been dis- I've actually been discussing that with my daughter. And we're looking at doing something. Maybe we'll incorporate you with it. Um, looking at something that we can do to have a platform uh, that would include me from the British, Jewish, Israeli side. Um, and my experience, having lived with also Ebos and in England, among all different cultures and races mm-hmm. and religions, and see what we can do for the black community but then in was Israel. That, yeah, but more. was that shooting an isolated incident, or was that something that, because you tend to write when it's like enough is enough kind of thing. Was that an isolated incident, or were they, was it not just a shooting, but there was a sense of, look, you've been... In our injustice means for so long we just had enough, and this is the camera yeah. the story that brought yeah. the camera back. What, what, what would you... It was an isolated shooting, okay, but it wasn't an isolated case of degradation and racism, okay, and, and injustice for equality. That's the difference. So, yes, it had been enough is enough because when they came to Israel, I don't know what they expected or were promised mm. in per se, though I haven't looked into it that deeply yet. Yeah. Um, but the, I believe that the, the potential could should be a lot higher than what it is today. Uh, saying that the, the younger generation are creating that. Mm. Um, I'll explain all of that in one story after I explained about the different blacks that live in Israel. Okay. But are they allowed to, to join the army, though, the Ethiopians? Are they the they same 18? After. Okay. After. Mandatory. Okay. You're, okay. They're Israeli Jewish citizens. They must. Okay. Not only Israeli Jewish people go into the army here. We have Druze that go into the army. The who? Arab Druze. They're Druzim, they're called. Druzim. It's another Arab sector. Okay. They're not Christian, they're not Muslim, they're Druzim. We'll talk about that another time. There's okay, a lot okay. going on here. There's okay. a lot, lot going on here. Like I said, it's like this massive salad bowl, which yeah. some of it is integrated and some of it is chopped up together. So we've got the Ethiopian Jews, you mentioned some yeah. of the African migrants, and and who, 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 you, I think I've heard something about black Jews as well, something like that, or black, black Hebrews. Hebrews. Okay. Yeah, the black Hebrews, they live, they segre- uh, uh, created themselves uh, um, like a, an area in a place called Dimona originally. Some now don't live there anymore, like from the younger generation that moved down a little bit. Um, so I met a few black Hebrews lived, when I lived in Tel Aviv particularly or mm. in Tel Aviv at clubs and stuff, uh, some hip hop clubs. Um, and I've met, there's some black Hebrew women that on the beach braid people's hair, you know, for some extra, extra money and things like that. Uh, where are they the from? Are, are they, are they, are they're they, American. Oh, American. They're, well, African Americans. African Americans, wow. Christian. That okay. believe that Israel is their motherland. Not Africa, Israel. But Israel. Is Israel is there. Not mother. Africa. They, they came, they, they're, they're thinking even before Africa, we came from Israel. Yep. Okay. And, and how are they treated? Are they in society? They have uh, rights to remain, most of them. They mm-hmm. haven't become integrated citizens, such as, but they're residents. And they... The integration is quite minimal, I would say, but I'm going back a few years because I haven't been in touch with any in the last 15 years or so, I would okay. say. Um, 
like I said, they live in Dimona. They have a community. Uh, some come and work in the mm. city. Um, some, you know, the younger generation rented apartments around Tel Aviv area. Do they speak uh, Hebrew or do they speak English? I don't. A uh, bit of both, but mainly English with an American accent. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, from what I understand is they do not go into the army. Okay. Because they're not citizens, so they're okay. Yeah. So then... So that's them. Then okay. you have... There was in the 90s, I would say, particularly, uh, a big migration of Africans come here, mm. mainly Nigerians. Okay. Some Yoruba, some Asa. Asa? Is that right? Yeah. Hausa? You've got Hausa, Igbo, and Yoruba. Yeah, those are the three main ones, yeah. Yeah, and mainly, mainly Igbos. Okay. Okay. Igbos. There were a few, I remember around the 90s uh, in the Tel Aviv area uh, that were from Ghana, uh, Kenya. Mm. Uh, this is not separating at the moment the whole Ethiopian side of it. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, and they came out uh, mainly illegally or as students. Okay. So they came, most of them came as students, mm. but then didn't study and... <laughs> Uh, were illegal and worked either in construction or cleaning or warehouses. It was all black money market, mm. all you know, cash in hand. Okay. Um, and then a lot of them met uh, Israelis, Israeli residents or citizens, mm. and uh, settled. Some of them met. Um, African or Filipinos as well. Okay. Because there was also a Filipino big migration, I would say, around then at okay. the same time. And um, so now we're looking into the second generation uh, that there are interracial marriages okay. of Israelis and Africans and Africans and in Philippines living here in Israel. Mm. So those statuses had to fight for their rights. And it was usually the legal partner that would have to do most of the fighting. Okay. Like go to the immigration offices, uh, fill in millions of forms, prove that you're together. Okay. Uh, I think it's like that in most immigrations around the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we couldn't get married here because he wasn't Jewish, my partner, who I met in 1999. And, um, but there were people that did get married here, such as a good friend of mine who married uh, an Israeli Russian, and they got married as Catholics because she uh, was, became Catholic. She wasn't Jewish fully anyway. Mm. Uh, because her father was Jewish, not her mother. Okay. A little, another, another thing not yeah. to divert from. Yeah. <laughs> There's more, more complications. Yeah. And they got married. They got married in a Catholic church in Yaffa, in near Tel Aviv. So, but then, but so looking at the the the, we, we touch on the black Hebrews and sort of Ethiopians, and we're looking at the African migrants. So. Coming, yeah. coming in. I have, I have a friend. I have a friend that's been married. I have a few friends that have been married over 25 years to their African partners here in Israel and have children. Mm. And uh, the children are citizens. And they, they, over the time, did become citizens of Israel. But then, uh, uh, when we, so we look at the shaking of sort of awareness about racism and things which of the groups are black hebrews or ethiopians or african migrants have a, seem to have the more coordinated or the sort of loudest voice to say hey okay this is enough is mm -hmm. enough here now if you think about here in the uk i think a lot yeah. of the indies sort of the the wind rush you mentioned wind rush a lot of that generation 
Um, and more than the Africans, aren't they? I've noticed that as well. Yeah, because they've they could have been here more than seventy years, and they've they, you know their yeah. kids have moved on. You get a lot of the Africans who are either they were born here and they went back to their country and have come back in, um, are very much very different focus. Very much of a well, you know, with, with more middle class, you get more a lot of the African African migrants who have come back more middle class focus on business and work and are because they can reflect back at you know things are tougher back in west africa or in africa that this isn't nothing you know and so they there's then they may not be as vocal with the race and they just focus on look i've got my one or two houses i've got my kids in private school my child need... has to be a doc- my my child has to be a doctor or a lawyer. Yeah. So my so so that there is a less sense they don't. They, it's not as if they don't not not notice it, but they focus on you know it's when it's not going to stop. I've it. noticed that. Yeah. I've noticed that as well, and that is uh, happening with the families that are uh, here in Israel living. I I believe that they doing it more for the second generation. I would say the same about myself. A lot of what I've done since my daughter was born and same goes for my ex-husband, her father, would be for her generation mm. to make sure that she has the best life that she can live yeah. and uh, be educated, etc. So I think that is a very African thing now. Thinking about yeah, that. I mean, I, I, when because I live... I have in... friends that are still, you know, I have a friend that came from Nigeria, an evil friend, and he had, I think it was like a laboratory uh, diploma uh, to to work in laboratories mm. that he wasn't accepted here in Israel. And it took mm. him many years until he got his citizenship and status here anyway. Yeah. And by the time that time, you know, time had passed, it wasn't. So he did other jobs, you know, more like you say, not even middle class, possibly some lower class. Yeah, jobs. yeah. But he's satisfied. He was satisfied to do that. He wanted to live in Israel. He met the love of his life. Mm. Um, and they have together three beautiful boys. And he later found out he has a, a daughter in Nigeria. Uh, it came, came out much later on. Um, mm. But yes, his focus is on uh, Judaism at the moment. He's converted to Judaism. So the Igbos were accepted to convert I have a very brief conversion to Judaism. The Sephardi Jewish uh, rabbis uh, believed and accepted um, the uh, research that has been done by Igbo professors mm. and education uh, that, that it is very highly likely that the Igbos are actually Jewish heri- uh, uh, orientation. Mm-hmm. Okay, I mean that'd be, I mean that'd be something that to be very possible. If mm. if I go by what my ex-husband uh, used to explain to me, that it's it's possible even that the Ethiopians are not the Lost Dan tribe, that it's the Ebo. Mm. But because the Ethiopians, uh, it's very that's also complex, but it's a possibility. Okay, well. You know, it's amazing that we could probably go on for hours and hours because we've, you know, we've, 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 um, it's hard to touch the surface because, um, and I, so and, hard. I, and, so and, I hard. and I, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to delve into any of the politics and the conflicts because those are very, you know, these are things that you, you can listen to on the news. I think it's very fascinating to hear from someone on the ground who has had, um, who was married to, a, a, a Nigerian, a black man, has a, has has a daughter, and but then also lives here in the UK. You've travelled around, and then to notice how sort of the integration, because the, the, as I said, the, the scene from the outside in is like the, the the Jews have been persecuted for so many years, you know, annihilated. You know, the, the Hitler wanted to annihilate, annihilate them, you know, in the second June, you know, in the forties. And so they've got a place where they can feel safe. And you'd think anyone coming in, we know what it's like to be persecuted. We're not going to let that happen. So 
hopefully, you know, like anything, generations shift and, and, and people change like your daughter's generation. But as I said, it's been really good to, to, to listen to that. And I, I hope that we can sort of highlight more so, not just sort of the negatives that's happening around racism, but maybe in some of the positives that are happening and, and really yeah. get Israel. And there are, there are some, yeah. there are yeah. some positives, particularly with the younger generation, my daughter's generation. I think there is going to be a lot of positive outcomes. Yeah. Um, just saying about the integration and segregation, some of it is done by the community themselves and that's not necessarily such a bad thing in my opinion mm. because people need to keep their culture yeah. and you know the whole thing about you know people with what's been going on at the moment with the situation in america which mm. yes has become a big issue now worldwide mm. and and i'm glad that it has i'm i'm angry i'm disappointed yeah. it's not something that i've ever felt non-disgust towards over my whole in my whole life but i think that it's 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 the good thing that's come out of it is that people are discussing it uh people are creating groups actions have been happening and i and i really really do believe that a change is going to come but people must understand that they need to have their culture and uh, they need to be acknowledged also for their color of their skin in a positive way yeah so all the racism words that go out like uh i don't see color because mm. like if i would say to you namdi i don't see you as a person of color but you yeah. are mm. you are a person of color that you also worked with me at gsk in the multi-faith group and you've got a beautiful family and you've worked very hard to get to where you've got to and you have an amazing chat and you're this and you're this and you're this mm. you know what i mean yeah yeah so yes we white people must acknowledge the differences but must embrace them as well and accept them the, i think you know appreciation versus appropriation is a necessity yeah well we you know I, to... now you've, you've touched on a great deal and i think later on when we launch our um chat with the uh, with the different religions because that's going to be something that I'll, I'll, oh. another series it'd be good to, to to get that point of view and stuff but going back to our roots where we met <laughs> yes yeah yeah so i mean uh, yeah the, the, we're going to have a series for this is our series on lifestyles and life stories and stuff so i would definitely appreciate the uh, the time the the you know, li, you know being open and, and giving us a lot of insights in, into your life growing up and, and living out there and um, yeah, definitely thanks a lot and uh, we'll be seen. <laughs>